Uh, and Mel is someone who, in his recent work, and I gather in his continuing work, as he's working a, a, on a very important book on the uh, Bush presidency right now, uh, makes these connections, which I think is a passion of mine as a historian at a policy school. Uh, so it is with great pleasure and it's a great honor to introduce uh, Mel Leffler, uh, the, who's the Edward Statinius Professor of History at the uh, University of Virginia and who's won any number of, I was just looking at this, dis, you've won about every distinguished fellowship there is to win, so I'm not even going to list them all, and who's going to be speaking uh, today on Cold War Lessons and Contemporary Dilemmas. Uh, so if you could please uh, join me in welcoming Mel Leffler to uh, the LBJ Library. Frank, thank you. That, that's really a lovely introduction. I, I really appreciate it. And my friend said, Virginia told me that if I come to Austin between the Oklahoma and Missouri games, uh, no one was likely to have any interest whatsoever in national security in the Cold War. But uh, uh, the turnout here uh, amazes me. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for coming. And um, Frank's uh, allusions to preponderance of power, I'm glad that he has uh, marked it up and, and looked at every page because my two children who lived with this book for, what, 15 years or so, when I finally finished it, they got a T-shirt for me. And instead of preponderance of power, they wrote on it preponderance of pages, which is <laughs> the way all my graduate students now refer to that book. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad it is, it's, it's somewhat useful. And it's, it, it is a pleasure to be here. And I've spent uh, quite a few weeks here years ago um, at, the, at, at the LBJ Library when I was writing this recent book that just came out uh, last year for the, for the Soul of Mankind. And this is a, a wonderful, wonderful place uh, to work. And I'm really indebted uh, to Betty Sue Flowers also for helping to sponsor um, a conference around which uh, another edited collection that I'm working called The Cambridge History of the Cold War will appear next year and, and uh, Betty Sue and, uh, and the LBJ Library along with uh, the Wilson Center in Washington and the Truman Library were, were kind enough to host three key conferences and I, I'm really indebted to you Betty Sue. Thank you very much. So, so I want to talk today about um, contemporary dilemmas and, and what the Cold War might have to say with regard to some of these problems. You all know uh, we face profound dilemmas and uh, a new one has emerged, you might say, in the last few weeks, uh, a global financial and economic crisis of an unprecedented nature since uh, the Great Depression. And it helps us to place the Great Depression uh, and the Cold War in some larger perspective that has real salience in ways that maybe five years ago or ten years ago uh, many students and, and scholars had forgotten, and I, I will get to that. But we face a host of problems, a great global financial crisis, how to deal with terrorism, how to deal with the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, how to deal with religious fundamentalism, global warming, how to deal with an ambitious China, how to deal with a resurgent Russia, how to deal with energy shortages, how to deal with global inequality. These are all critical national security matters on the nation's agenda, in fact, on the agenda of almost every nation in the world. So the, does the Cold War provide a guide for tackling these sorts of contemporary problems? And you'll see that my answer is yes, an unqualified yes. But the Cold War itself, as many of you know, lends itself to very different interpretations, to very contrasting narratives. And perhaps most of all, nowadays, the end of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, is generating some of the most contentious debates about how to understand the past and what lessons we can all learn from the past. Now, I think there are two 
major, two major contrasting narratives about the end of the Cold War. And they are competing in our collective memories right now. First, there is what I'll call, for shorthand sake, the triumphalist view. It goes like this. American policies, especially the policies of Ronald Reagan, won the Cold War. We need, therefore, to build military strength, possess moral clarity, promote democracy, deregulate markets, and stimulate free enterprise. That's one broad interpretation. A second one is very different. For simplicity's sake, I'll call it the blowback interpretation. It goes like this. American policies in the Cold War were misguided. American policies in the Cold War were short-sighted, especially at the end of the Cold War. American officials, particularly Reagan and his advisors, exaggerated the strength of the adversary. They therefore overbuilt overbuilt American mil military capabilities and weakened the United States economy. In addition, the blowback school argues that in order to thwart, in order to stop Soviet or contain Soviet expansion, American officials aligned the United States with conservative autocrats like, autocrats like the Saud family in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and authoritarian dictators like the Somozas in Nicaragua, and even with radical jihadists during the Reagan years. Our, con our country, the blowback school argues, is now facing the consequences of these policies. And champions of the blowback school go on to question, they go on to question whether the United States even won the Cold War. Military expenditures, massive debts, and trade imbalances, they say, distorted the American economy and enabled competitors to take advantage of America's foolish foreign policies. So these are two very, very divergent interpretations. And let me make clear my own view. I don't, I don't subscribe to either of these two schools, but they are profoundly important, and they shape the, dis the interpretive discourse, not only about the history of the Cold War, but also about contemporary, what we should be doing right now. Now, I disagree with the blowback school, because fundamentally, I think there were, I think there were winners and losers in the Cold War. In fact, the clearest generalization one can make about the Cold War is that the Soviet Union and its form of communism lost the Cold War. That seems like a pretty self-evident finding, but it's very important. It tells us something very important, and I'm going to explain that later on, what it is that it tells us. Now, I also believe that the triumphalist version of the Cold War is historically incorrect. Even though it's incorrect, as I'll explain, this triumphalist version of the Cold War is nonetheless very, very consequential. Very consequential. History matters because people draw lessons and invoke meaning from the past. And the people who George W. Bush chose to advise him, the people who George W. Bush brought into his cabinet, into the most influential positions in his cabinet, believed that Ronald Reagan not only had a coherent grand strategy to win the Cold War, but that that grand strategy, in fact, was what did win the Cold War. Simply stated, they believed, these people who joined the Bush administration, believed that Ronald Reagan had built strength, exerted leadership, 
squeezed the evil empire economically, demonstrated moral clarity, championed democracy, cut taxes and deregulated markets, and unleashed free enterprise, and then forced Mikhail Gorbachev to capitulate. President Bush, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld said in 2003, President Bush, Rumsfeld said, like Ronald Reagan, has not shied from calling evil by its name, nor has he shied from the intention to defeat evil's latest incarnation, terrorism, just as free men and free women defeated fascism and communism before, end quote. Now, I quote Rumsfeld because Rumsfeld was not a neoconservative. That's important because it illustrates that triumphalism goes well beyond the neoconservatives, well beyond the neoconservatives. And precisely because triumphalism is widely believed, it has bequeathed a very woeful, a very negative legacy. In my view, triumphalism has encouraged self-righteousness, inspired unilateralism, prompted the use of military force, squandered lives, squandered wealth, and weakened the United States economically. Triumphalism has bred a disdain for arms control and for counter-proliferation efforts. And perhaps most of all, nowadays, we can see another consequence of triumphalism. It glorified free markets and trivialized the role of the state in taming free markets. It glorified free markets and trivialized the role of the state in ensuring the equitable distribution of the benefits of free markets. Now, perhaps I would be less critical of the consequences of triumphalism if I felt that it accurately interpreted the past, especially the end of the Cold War. But I think triumphalism inaccurately <laughs> depicts the end of the Cold War, Cold War for two very key reasons. Triumphalism, in my view, is mistaken for two very, very critical reasons. First, Ronald Reagan did not have a grand strategy. His policies, I suggest, reflected conflicting, conflicting impulses within himself and even more so within his administration. Second reason I think triumphalism is historically inaccurate is because I think it is very evident now from Russian records that Reagan's grand strategy, so-called grand strategy, even if he had had one, did not win the Cold War, did not win the Cold War. Now, I also want to emphasize that I say these things not to denigrate Ronald Reagan. Anyone reading my new book, the last chapter of my new book, will see that I have quite a degree of respect for Ronald Reagan. In fact, most of my friends on the left are very chagrined by how much respect I show for Reagan in, my, in the last chapter of my book. But the problem with triumphalism, as I try to explain, is that it simplifies Reagan. It distorts through simplification the entire history of the end of the Cold War.
Reagan was, in fact, a far more complex man and a far more interesting man than the triumphalists, or the critics for that matter, would lead you to believe. Reagan wanted to build strength. We all know about the great military buildup of 1981 and 82 and 83. But he didn't want to fight the enemy. He wanted strength in order to negotiate with the adversary, negotiate from strength. He supported the, street, the Strategic Defensive Initiative, what became known as Star Wars. He was a great champion of Star Wars, the champion of Star Wars. But not to bankrupt or squeeze the Soviets, as triumphalists would lead you to believe. He supported Star Wars because Roosevelt, uh, because Reagan sincerely, however naively, believed in eliminating nuclear weapons, that Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative, would provide a framework for eventually eliminating nuclear weapons, something that astonished most of the hardliners when they really came to realize that that's what Reagan had in mind. Reagan loved to talk about democracy, but in truth, he supported some of the most repugnant dictators, including Saddam Hussein, and he supported some of the most fundamentalist groups on the face of the earth, including some of the predecessors of the Taliban. Not moral clarity, as the triumphalists would like you to think. Not moral clarity. But moral ambiguity characterized Ronald Reagan's foreign policies. And this was most conspicuous, most conspicuous in Reagan's desire to talk to the very men in the Kremlin who ran the evil empire, the evil empire that Reagan loved to vilify in his public speeches. Yet we now know from a series of letters in the Reagan library that Ronald Reagan long wanted to engage the very men he demonized. Reagan used to joke, and he used to say, I wanted to talk to the leaders of the Soviet Union before Gorbachev, but they kept dying on me, one after another. <laughs> and those of us who were alive at the time and following current events did not take him seriously at all. We thought it was a joke. It was a joke. It seemed like a joke. But to the amazement of scholars, and I was one, one of the first, but so, certainly will not be the only one, to dwell upon these series of letters that now have been declassified in the Reagan Library. I first found them there in the summer of 2003, or maybe it was 2004, when they had just been declassified. A series of letters to Soviet leaders preceding Mikhail Gorbachev. Letters that went first to Brezhnev, then to Andropov, and then to Konstantin Chernenko. Several of the letters were written in Reagan's hand, not typed, but written in his hand, in order to make them seem more personal, more sincere, for, for him to really convey a notion to these Soviet leaders that he really was behind these suggestions. And so in a typical one of these, what are they, six or nine letters that he wrote to Soviet leaders prior to Gorbachev, they went sort of like this. This is one to Chernenko in 1984. Reagan's writing, I have no greater goal than the establishment of a relationship between our two great nations characterized by constructive cooperation. We seek to defend our interests, but not to challenge your security. I want you to know that neither I nor the American people hold any offensive intentions toward you or to the Soviet people. 
our constant and our urgent purpose must be lasting reductions of tensions between us. I pledge to you my profound commitment to that end. Now, once again, that's not an atypical letter. That's a typical letter that went. And there are six or nine of these. And very few people in the American government, very few people in the American government knew that such letters were being written and exchanged. Some of these letters were often written days just after Reagan gave some of his most famous speeches publicly denouncing the Soviet Union as an evil empire and then writing privately, let's try to enter into negotiations. I understand your problems. In fact, Reagan had, as some of his closest advisors in the White House, especially Bud McFarlane, and even more importantly, Jack Matlock, as they came to realize that Reagan was seriously interested in opening negotiations with the Soviet Union, that it wasn't just rhetoric, that his private statements to that effect were actually true, they began writing, McFarlane and Matlock, and these, many of these memos are now available too, they began writing him memos about Soviet history, Soviet politics, Soviet culture, just so Reagan would get a better understanding. And notwithstanding the stereotype that Reagan hated to read, Reagan actually did read these things, and quite carefully, these short memos. And there's a revealing diary entry that says a lot. I'm quoting from his diary now. Three years, he wrote in 1984, three years, have taught me something surprising about the Russians. Many people at the top of the Soviet hierarchy are genuinely afraid of America. Perhaps that should not have surprised me, but it does." End quote. So Reagan did not squeeze the Soviets into a defeat, as the triumphalists would have you think. But Reagan engaged the Soviet Union. So the triumphalists are wrong not only in overstating the clarity of Reagan's view or its consistency in terms of a grand strategy, but they are also mistaken in asserting that the Soviets bowed to American strength. Because from Soviet records, from Russian records now, it's increasingly clear that Gorbachev embarked on a reform agenda because of his own desire to improve the functioning of the Soviet system. In fact, Star Wars, rather than intimidating Gorbachev into concessions, Star Wars actually made his life more difficult. It gave Gorbachev's enemies ammunition to use against his own desire to reduce military spending and curtail the arms race. Gorbachev liked to say, we're surrounded by superior economies, not by superior weaponry. That's what he wanted to focus on, and it had little to do with the American military buildup. So the buildup of American military power was not the decisive factor bringing about the end of the Cold War. It doesn't provide us with a good understanding of the past. And it's not a guide to contemporary dilemmas. But I want to emphasize the blowback narrative is also not a guide to contemporary dilemmas. Blowback, the blowback interpretation foc focuses on misguided military tactics, unsavory alliances with dictators in the third world, and American imperialist impulses. <clears throat> 
I think insofar as the blowback school touches upon those things, it is illuminating, but it elides, the blowback school elides and obscures an absolutely fundamental truth. In the conflict, in the conflict between competing ways of organizing political economies, in the conflict between competing visions of human welfare, the Soviet version lost. The Soviet version lost. And it's an important truth because the Cold War actually was about alternative ways of life. It was a geopolitical struggle. It was an economic contest. Most of all, most of all, the Cold War was an ideological battle. Ode Arne Westad, one of the Cold War's really great historians, in a recent book said that the best way to characterize the Cold War, the best way to characterize the Cold War is as a struggle between an American empire of liberty and a Soviet empire of justice. Now, the Americans were not building an empire of liberty. And believe me, the Soviets were not constructing an empire of justice. But Westad is nonetheless right. Westad is nonetheless right in emphasizing that these two contestants, the United States and the Soviet Union, represented alternative tracks to modernization. They represented alternative tracks to human uplift around the entire globe. And what's more important is we now know from Soviet records, from the Politburo meetings, from the records of the top of the Soviet hierarchy, that Soviet leaders took this contest extremely seriously. Stalin, Molotov, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, I want to emphasize, not one of them, no matter what you might think of them, not one of them in their own minds thought they represented an evil empire. They believed that communism and advanced socialism represented a superior road to human betterment. They were sincere believers that they offered something better to humanity. The archival record reveals, in particular, that Stalin's successors, all of them, took their ideological mandate very seriously. They took it seriously in the following way. They believed, absolutely believed, that their system could outproduce capitalism, that it could provide a superior way of life, and that most of all, it could serve as an example for all of mankind. This is what they believed. Whether true or not is another matter, but this is what they believed. What's even more important, however, is that for several decades, for several decades, through the late 40s, the 50s, and 60s, and perhaps into the middle and late 70s, for several decades, large chunks of humanity around the globe large numbers of people everywhere seem to agree. And that's why the Cold War was such an intense struggle to win the soul of mankind. The Cold War was a global struggle, not primarily, not primarily because of Soviet military capabilities. The Cold War was a global struggle because communism, socialism and state planning had enormous resonance, had an enormous constituency after, in the aftermath of two world wars, a Great Depression, and centuries of European imperialism. Capitalism was in disrepute at the end of World War II. 
the future of capitalism was uncertain. Ten years ago, when I said that thing, nobody could believe that it was true. Nowadays, people are thinking, eh, maybe that is true. Maybe there is some, some inherent problems. The important point is that after World War II, communist parties everywhere, at the end of World War II and the years immediately after World War II, communist parties grew astronomically. Communist parties had significant local support in places like France and Italy and, of course, China. In France and Italy in the late 1940s, they were the first or second, the communist parties were the first or second largest party in totally free elections, getting somewhere between 25 and 45 percent of the popular vote. Stalin's image, you need to recall, was refashioned, Stalin's image was refashioned by Soviet heroism during World War II. The triumph over Nazism revitalized the appeal of communism. It revitalized the appeal of communism, especially within the Soviet Union itself. It made Soviets really for the first time proud of their system. And the substantial growth rates that the Soviet Union experienced in, the, in its economy, especially in certain sectors of the economy, like electrical production, coal and steel, in the late 40s and 50s, those growth rates underscored the attractiveness of state planning and a command economy for many peoples in the third world. Many peoples who were then throwing off the shackles of imperialism and, of course, looking, seeking, yearning for a fast track to industrialization and modernization. So the Kremlin was a formidable competitor to the United States, indeed a formidable competitor in the 1950s and 60s when it seemed, when it appeared to unlock the secrets of rapid industrialization and modernization. It was a formidable competitor in the 50s and 60s when the Kremlin appeared capable of providing educational opportunity and nurturing scientific achievement like Sputnik. It appeared as a formidable competitor when the Kremlin very easily in the 50s and 60s could discredit the West for its ongoing imperial record in the third world. But what's very important is that the Kremlin could not compete for the soul of mankind in Asia and Africa, the Middle East and elsewhere, when the era of decolonization ended as it did in the middle 1970s. It could not compete when it became apparent at about the same time, that is the mid 1970s, that Soviet leaders themselves could not make good, could not make good on their promises to offer their own peoples and those of Eastern Europe superior health care, better education, good housing, nutritious food, and entertainment. That was the promise of communism. And by the mid-70s, it became clear that that promise was not materializing. So in fact, consumer capitalism and social democracy won the Cold War. Consumer capitalism and social democracy. When peoples in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union had a chance to choose, when Gorbachev allowed such a choice at the end of the 1980s for all intents and purposes, the peoples of Eastern Europe and of Russia rejected the Soviet model and the Soviet Union. Is this narrative salient for our own time? I think it's very salient. What proved most important in the Cold War was not superior military capabilities, not sophisticated public diplomacy, not 
artful foreign policies. All these things were valuable, but not decisive. What proved most decisive was the capacity of the United States and its allies to offer and sustain a way of life that appealed to large numbers of people, a way of life that respected the, dignities, the dignity of individuals, a way of life that empowered people as autonomous human beings, a way of life that, in fact, nurtured dreams, stimulated fantasies, and engendered creativity and entrepreneurship. Consequently, there are really important lessons that the Cold War offers. These lessons, as I'm arguing, don't comport, don't coincide with a triumphalist or a blowback view of history. But I nonetheless would submit that they are very valuable lessons nonetheless. So here are some very concrete lessons of the Cold War. First, the importance of understanding the threat. The most successful American policies during the Cold War actually took place at the beginning of the Cold War. There were many threats, many threats at the beginning of the Cold War. There are many threats today, as I outlined at the very beginning of the lecture. Sometimes it's easy to simplify the perception of threat at the beginning of the Cold War, but it wasn't simple to policymakers at the time. In 1946 and 47 and 48, American policymakers made a critical decision about threat perception. They determined in these critical years, 46, 47, and 48, that socioeconomic ferment in Europe and revolutionary nationalist fervor in Asia and Africa were the greatest threat, not Soviet military capabilities, not the prospect of a Soviet attack in Europe. The Marshall Plan, absolutely the most important American foreign policy of the entire Cold War, the Marshall Plan, announced in 1947, implemented in 1948, focused on economic reconstruction at a time when some people, at, the time, at a time when some people said the United States should be primarily militarily rearming. But policymakers said, no, the major threat is not the prospect of Soviet military aggression. It's the prospect of the Soviets capitalizing on socioeconomic ferment in Europe and revolutionary nationalism in the third world. Defining a threat carefully is of critical importance, the major threat. Second lesson, define goals carefully. The overriding American goal, national security goal throughout the Cold War, the overriding goal was to deny, was to deny the Soviet Union control over the preponderant resources and skilled labor of Europe and Asia. This was the overriding American objective of the entire Cold War. At the end of the Cold War, 1988, Reagan's national security advisors wrote up a memorandum in which they said, Reagan's advisors said, quote, every administration since World War II has endorsed the concept that the United States in partnership with its allies must prevent the Soviet Union from dominating the great concentration of industrial power and human capacity that are in Western Europe and East Asia. This orientation placed a tremendous emphasis, a tremendous focus on Western Europe, Western Germany, and Japan. But policymakers in Washington quickly grasped that these countries, Western Europe, Western Germany, and Japan, needed markets and raw materials, especially in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. Hence, preserving stability in the periphery in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, preserving stability became a critical 
American national security goals. Note, note, the goal was stability, not democracy promotion. The goal was stability, not democracy promotion. This sometimes had unfortunate consequences, very unfortunate consequences, but it reflected a critical, important lesson. Policymakers defined goals and assigned priorities. Third lesson of the Cold War. The United States benefits the United States benefits from an open world order. Now, at the end of World War II, in 1945 and 46 and 47, there was a great debate in America about America's role in international economic affairs. Policymakers in Washington look back at the interwar years, the 1920s and the 1930s, and they said, they believed that high tariffs, rigid currency policies, quantitative restrictions on trade, that these things had contributed to the Great Depression and to the rise of totalitarianism and to the onset of world war. So the lesson learned, the lesson learned was that in the aftermath of World War II, the United States had to help stabilize currencies, lower tariffs, and promote the free flow of goods. These policies, I want to emphasize, ushered in the most prosperous period in human history for the peoples of Western Europe and Japan. The United States exercised a benevolent hegemony over this international economic order, co-opting old enemies, promoting global prosperity, even when such efforts engendered, as they did at times, real costs for the United States and for Americans. <coughs> Retreating on an open international order nowadays, as some people will be inclined to do, in times of very tough economic conditions, retreating on an open world order will not produce peace, prosperity, equality, or justice. A fourth lesson, open markets and free enterprise must be tamed by an enlightened state, by an enlightened government. The dynamism of free markets must be harnessed to the needs of people. The dynamism of markets must be harnessed to the needs of people. In 1944, at the same time that Franklin Roosevelt was championing the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the United Nations, at the very same time that Roosevelt was trying to convince the American people to accept a new international economic order. He nonetheless, in a very important speech, his most important speech during World War II on domestic affairs, said the United States needed a post-war economic bill of rights. He said that the United States had, had to sustain the New Deal into the post-war era. The role of the government in the domestic political economy had to be preserved. The government, Roosevelt said, must ensure employment opportunities, decent housing, adequate medical care, and security in old age. The government had a responsibility. Ultimately, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan won the Cold War because their governments prevented another depression and avoided another era of intra-capitalist conflict. The United States, Western Europe, and Japan won the Cold War because they harnessed the private marketplace to meet the needs of their peoples.
a free marketplace needed regulation by a powerful state. And this was recognized by the labor government in Great Britain that threw out Winston Churchill in 1945. It was recognized by Christian Democrats and socialists throughout post-war Western Europe. And of course, it was also recognized in the United States. Over time, over time, as a result of these policies, the left, which had tremendous popularity in Western Europe and around the globe at the end of World War II, as a result of these policies, the left was co-opted by the improved standards of living in capitalist democracies, by growing equality, by unprecedented educational opportunities, and by the lore and the glamour of consumer capitalism and mass entertainment. Opportunity and justice, in other words, complemented free, elect free elections and participatory democracy. The state, the government, ensured opportunity and nurtured equality. A fifth lesson of the Cold War. There are eight, and I'll get to finish. <laughs> the fifth lesson, multilateralism, not unilateralism, works. The United States did act unilaterally during the Cold War, during the Cold War. And when it did so, the United States often made things worse. When, for example, it crossed the 38th parallel into North Korea, pretty much on its own, and then when it chose to intervene militarily, pretty much on its own, in Vietnam. And cooperating with allies during the Cold War, frankly, was always extremely difficult. It was never easy. But multilateralism ultimately was a key to victory in the Cold War. Co-opting friends like France and West Germany and England and Japan, co-opting friends and former adversaries meant a great deal. And today, today, in today's world, all the greatest threats that we face, terrorism, financial instability, nuclear proliferation, climate warming, drug trafficking, global inequality, every single one of these things requires multilateral, collaborative action. A sixth lesson, talk to the adversary. Talk to the adversary. Throughout the Cold War, the United States actually talked to the Soviet Union, and frequent summit meetings during the Reagan-Gorbachev years were immensely productive. But it's important when you talk to your adversary to realize a crucial factor. Your adversary will desire, just as you desire, to negotiate from strength. Your adversary believes that he must negotiate from strength, just as you think you need to negotiate from strength. This is a dilemma. It's an inescapable dilemma. But it's no escape from talking to the adversary, a key lesson of the end of the Cold War. Seventh, avoid rhetorical traps. Anti-communism in the United States, especially in the 40s and the 50s, mobilized the population for unprecedented national security initiatives. But it made it very difficult to get Americans to grasp that there were differences between China and Russia. Anti-communism made it difficult to get Americans to grasp that revolutionary nationalist leaders in Asia and Africa who embraced state planning as they did in the 1950s and who vilified the West as they did in the 50s and the 60s, that nonetheless they were not the pawns of Moscow and Beijing. 
So today, we need to be careful that the rhetoric about a war on terror does not undermine our ability to wean rogue regimes and failing states from terrorist groups. Terrorism, we must always recall, is a tactic. It's not a movement. Terrorism is not an adversary. Rhetoric must not obfuscate the threat. Rhetoric must not entrap us. That's a key lesson of the Cold War. And the last lesson is acknowledge the necessity, hard as it is, acknowledge the necessity of moral ambiguity. You can do this even while the United States pursues its values prudently, thoughtfully, persistently even. Everyone must realize that national security policy is about very difficult choices in an uncertain world, very difficult choices in an uncertain world with limited capabilities. Trade-offs, therefore, are inevitable, and trade-offs are wise. So in conclusion, here are the lessons of the Cold War. We need to identify principal threats. We need to define primary foreign policy goals. We need to adhere to our own values. We need to, ex we need to set priorities. We need to make difficult trade-offs. We must not overreach. We need to talk to adversaries and collaborate with allies. And perhaps most of all, we need to stay focused on revitalizing our own society, realizing realizing always the importance of the state in regulating markets and fostering opportunity. Healthy societies, vi vibrant societies, societies that nurture individual opportunity, societies that respect the dignity of individuals, societies that seek justice and equality as well as freedom, these sorts of societies <coughs> defuse foes, they win converts, and they empower their own citizens. And therein, in these sorts of societies, rests not only individual security, but also national security. And that's the great lesson of the Cold War. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. You gave us not just a masterful account, interpretation of one of the most controversial and contested uh, issues in recent history. You connected it to our current dilemmas uh, beautifully, and uh, uh, that, was, that was just outstanding. I'm sure there's lots of questions, but I, I can't resist um, jumping in and taking advantage of my position here, uh, asking you a, a quick question. I, I, I'm convinced, I mean, you lay out very well that these two interpretations of the Cold War really have something lacking. I, I'm particularly interested in your critique of the triumphalist one, which I think you very uh, accurately describe as overly focusing on military factors. And in your eight lessons, there's very little about what we call sort of hard military power. Uh, yet, I don't imagine that you mean to say it doesn't matter at all. And you mentioned the importance of denying the Soviets uh, geopolitical control of the Eurasian landmass which certainly had a, a military component. I wonder if you could comment maybe a little more specifically about what worked militarily during the Cold War, what didn't work, when we went too far. You know, for example, 
um, you know, was Korea a mistake? Was it not a mistake? Was the arms build up in the late 70s a mistake? Was it not a mistake? Just sort of a general overview of what role military factors played both in the Cold War and what we could sort of glean today. Well, I do think in, in, in a general, general way that the development um, of atomic weapons um, was a key element of deterrence. Uh, but it was never taken for granted and uh, because there was always – the arms race was fueled not by the prospect that you could actually use nuclear weapons, but by the prospect that the perception that you could use nuclear weapons would enable you to blackmail your adversary or enable your adversary to blackmail you. What was so critically important to the end of the Cold War, and we know this from Soviet records, is that Gorbachev decided something that actually I would, I think every president and every Soviet leader really knew but, was, but refused to act upon. And what Gorbachev decided was that <coughs> nuclear weapons absolutely will never be used and that it was ridiculous to keep up this arms race because you could reduce by tens of thousands <coughs> nuclear warheads and still have enough to ensure that no one will ever attack you. And in discussions that we now know that, that Gorbachev had with some of his closest advisors, especially Chernyev, he actually literally says this, no one is ever going to attack the Soviet Union again. We don't need these things. Now, in a certain way, I think most leaders realize that. What was so definitive about Gorbachev was that he was willing to act upon it, and he based his policies uh, 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 on that. I think in a certain way, just to extrapolate from your very broad question, um, uh, that there – one can, one can make some – an important allusion to the contemporary world order. For the entire Cold War, as I explained here, the, reason, the overriding concern from 1945, literally, to 1989, was that somehow the Soviet Union would, through subversion or through revolution or through popular will abroad, gain control one way or another of the key resources of Europe and, and, and Asia. That was the underlying frame of reference. And the reason the Soviet Union had such a capability was not because of its military potential, but because its ideology was appealing, because there was discontent with capitalism and democracy in various places, because nations in the third world were throwing off their imperialist masters, all the things I've talked about. That's what gave a framework to Soviet power to the potential of Soviet dominating Eurasia. What's important for today, what's so critically important today, for today, is that no nation has the possibility of doing that. No nation. So when people talk, I'm asked all the time, Cold War is a good business now in light of what happened in Georgia a few weeks ago. Everybody asks me, is there going to be another Cold War? No. There will be tensions with Russia, but there will not be another Cold War because Russia has no ideological appeal to anyone in the world, which is what made it. Russia is not going to be able to dominate Europe. China is not going to be able to dominate your Asia. This matters tremendously for American military policy today because even today, even today, when almost everyone would agree, what I just said is really not controversial. It's really not controversial. Everyone would pretty much subscribe to what I just said, and that the real threat is terrorism with terrorists with weapons of mass destruction. But if you look at our military budget today, the vast majority of America's expenditures, I'm willing to say, I don't know this, but I'm willing to guess, about 90 percent of America's military expenditures today are still spent on the types of weapons that were used, that were designed for the Cold War, for a war in Europe, meaning tanks, 
uh, and artillery and strategic capabilities. I would say, and I'm guessing I really do not know this, but I bet at most 10% of America's military budget is spent on counterterrorism and anti um, uh, and, and, and anti insurgency types things. That's a tremendous lesson to learn from all of this. But of course, there are powerful, very powerful bureaucracies in Washington that constrain change, that constrain change. But the key is for intelligent people to realize the types of threats that existed to the United States no longer exist. We have real threats. I'm a person that takes the prospect of terrorism with terrorists with weapons of man's destruction very seriously. And I say that it's a disgrace for the United States actually to have reconfigured its military budget so minutely in relationship to that threat. I think that's a big generalization to learn about what military policy was like during the Cold War and how it relates to today. Um, lots of questions. I, I see lots of students here, so I really want to encourage the students. Uh, um, and if you could identify yourself with Professor Loeffler. My name is Jesse. I'm uh, from the LB Day School. Um, uh, uh, Professor Loeffler, um, you mentioned, uh, well, I, I should say I really appreciated your um, very nuanced analysis of uh, Ronald Reagan, who's a figure that I've always learned and always thought of as maybe senile at best and diabolical <laughs> at, at, at worst. And, um, I, I, I guess I'm not completely convinced, though, because... I don't usually convince people who start <laughs> off with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would like to be convinced, sir. Okay. Um, but uh, he, uh, for all of his um, uh, nuanced views of foreign policy and for all his willingness to write very conciliatory notes to Cherenkov, um, he still was, was very willing to kind of beat the drum of war uh, and... and, and uh, be very um, kind of dualistic in terms of his public persona um, in America, and so I just um, wanted to ask you first, uh, how does that gel with his um, nuanced approach to foreign policy, and second of all, how does that um, sort of black and white uh, way of looking at the world affect today's um, very us and them discourse? Yeah, I, uh, Jesse, I, I think that that's a great question. I, I would say um, that, one, I would not myself use the word nuance to describe <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Um, I, say, I think I used the word that he had conflicting impulses, which is exactly the case. Um, it, what you're describing is that I would agree with you. Yes, some of the things you say, he was at times a hardliner. He did support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and the Contras in Nicaragua. Um, those things are all true. I wouldn't dispute those things for, for a moment. And moreover, I would say that he had a very shallow understanding of lots of problems, for example, in the Middle East, etc. Not a nuanced understanding, but a shallow understanding. But, but he had conflicting impulses that were very important. And one was a basic sense that you did need to engage your adversary. Um, and what was unique and so interesting about Reagan, and I would say true, and this is why I admire him, he also understood his own skills. His skills were not a nuanced understanding of foreign policy. His skills were to be able to sit down with other human beings and convince them of his goodwill, even when sometimes being very tough. We have now, the historian of the end of the Cold War benefits a lot from the fact that we have every single transcript of a Reagan-Gorbachev conversation. And we can see what Ronald Reagan said. Um, and you can see, he doesn't say things that are particularly intelligent. He also doesn't say things that are particularly foolish, as some people would like, like to believe. But he has a capacity <coughs> which he knew he had to say some very tough things in ways that were very disarming. And there is absolutely no question that he won the confidence of Gorbachev. Now, Gorbachev didn't make foreign policy simply because he liked Ronald Reagan. I'm not saying that. But, it wouldn't, but I believe it would have been impossible for him to have felt he could do the things 
he did, unless he had an interlocutor like Ronald Reagan. And in that sense, I mean two things. One, ultimately, he did like Reagan. But two, he had confidence in Reagan, confidence about a very important thing, and that is that if he signed an agreement with Reagan, Reagan would have the capacity to get it through Congress, the United States Senate. And for the Soviets, that mattered a lot. Because keep in mind, what all these Soviet leaders had just experienced was that they had spent a decade in the 1970s, almost a decade, negotiating the SALT II agreement. First with Nixon, the end of Nixon, then with Ford, then with Jimmy Carter. They finally got an agreement in 1979. It was presented to the Senate and then withdrawn because of, opposi because of opposition. So a key issue was, you know, can I negotiate with an American who's going to get this passed so that then I don't look like I have egg on my face here in Moscow? Because if I can't get them to sign an agreement that's going to be passed, it's going to look very foolish. And so that type of credibility was very important. Those are some of the things that I think are very important uh, about Ronald Reagan. And I think it supports the fact a man of conflicting impulses, not a coherent strategy, but, those con but he was able to put those conflicting impulses together and make it work in terms of great power diplomacy. In terms of great, not in terms of every, he handled many things terribly, I would suggest. But the big issue he handled extremely well. And he was courageous because people forget that when he negotiated the INF Treaty, the International Nuclear Forces Treaty with, with Gorbachev in 1987, the one real ag tangible agreement that he signed, that Reagan signed with Gorbachev, others were signed after Reagan left office in 1988. But at that time, there were a lot of critics. And there were many critics on the right. Henry Kissinger was against it. Brent Scowcroft was against it. Large numbers of the Republican constituency were against it. His Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, was against it. So that was what was important. But he was for it, and it mattered a great deal. ideological battle, like kind of a battle for the hearts and minds of the world, if you will, in the Cold War. Um, how would, is a similar dynamic present in, in today's world, and how, how might the U.S. Uh, and, and other nations respond, uh, respond to that challenge? Yeah, I think, I think it, it is relevant um, to today's world, because I think that there is a key issue in the world today, and that is um, how, well, one, one, we have another big issue. I was going to, I mean, the last few weeks, I mean, it's very important to keep Western economies um, uh, sta stable. But more, more specifically, when I, when I f first framed this argument, um, I was thinking about the importance of creating societies that peoples in the Islamic world will feel satisfied with and will feel they want to emulate. And I believe that, that, that one of the sources of great unrest in parts of the Islamic world relate to the fact that the types of regimes that exist there and the types of societies that have been created have not really provided effective responses. Now, I don't think that um, some of the Islamic fundamentalist groups, Al-Qaeda or whatever, they certainly aren't appealing in terms of a constructive ideology for the future, although they do articulate one. They do articulate one. Um, but even if their vision does not generate support, their criticism of the West and their criticism of the societies that the West has nurtured within their own countries has tremendous resonance. And that's why I think fundamentally, you know, the West won the Cold War because we were willing, to, able to create vibrant societies and co-opt the left. What's very important in today's world, and a, a direct um, 
lesson to be learned, I would say, for example, is that some of these Islamic fundamentalist groups get critical support, not in the Middle East, but in Germany, in Hamburg, in Frankfurt, in London, uh, in Liverpool, and places like that. So what, what is a lesson? A le the, the lesson learned was that in the 1940s and 50s, Western Europe, Britain, the United States, was able to co-opt the communist left by providing essentially opportunities <coughs> to people who never had had them. I would say what Western Europe and England has to work on right now is to provide these same sorts of opportunities to the Islamic minorities within their own country so that they feel integrated into their society. An analysis that have been written about, you know, why do Muslims in America, why are fewer Muslims in America supportive of these fundamentalist sects and terrorist actions is because in poll after poll, Muslims in America feel a greater stake and greater opportunity in American society than Muslims feel in Germany or France or England. And so I say there is something to be learned here. What was learned was that you need to co-opt and integrate. That's what I think is important. The back. Hi, sir. My name is Chris. I'm also with the LBJ School and the Little Policy Program. So thank you once again for joining us. One of your points that you made was that we have to acknowledge the necessity of moral ambiguity and that trade-offs were not just uh, wise, they were inevitable, what you said. Um, what are some examples of some specific trade-offs that we might have to make in the near future? And in general, what's your philosophy on finding a balance between what we might like to do and what we have to do in our foreign policy? No. I think that's a great question, and I, and I, I don't think that there are um, easy uh, answers to, to what you're saying. But what, uh, what, what, I'm, what, what I think is really important is to understand the fundamental dilemmas here, and for policymakers to understand, for students to understand it, students who in 15 years are going to be making pol policy in Washington and, and other capitals around the world. So I, I, would, I, I think one of the, the great mistakes of the last few years has been the, the um, sort of rhetorical emphasis on promoting, quote, democracy through, quote, free elections and electoral machinery. And I, I, I think that that, that is a, a mistake. I think that it also uh, um, trivializes, frankly, the nature of the infrastructure that societies must have in order to make democracy work. And so I would say that far more important than holding elections in a place like Iraq, which is symbolic, um, but far more important is to develop a court system. Far more important is to um, develop civil society, is to support all sorts of, um, of, of associational and volunteer groups. Um, these are the types of things that over decades create the framework for democracy. And I think that's the type of trade-off. Yes, it sometimes means that we will be dealing with leaders who are who are less respectable than we would want. Um, but I think that's a necessary trade-off. But I do think at the same time that it's important to make clear decisions. I believe that uh, it's one thing to say, well, we, we don't need to worry about free elections. That is what I'm saying often. That it shouldn't be a priority. But at the same time, at the same time, we should be able to have a discourse about when real genocidal actions occur and to try to take collaborative <laughs> multinational action when there is a consensus or a general view that genocide is taking place. And so I think at that point, intervention, collective collaborative military intervention in places like Rwanda or Darfur, for example, um, such an intervention is actually merited. And so I think those sorts of judgments, um, uh, you know, need, need, need to be made. We have time for about one, maybe two more questions. You didn't refer to it, but 
How important was Afghanistan in the collapse of the Soviet system? Well, um, it was it, it was symbolically it was symbolically important, and Gorbachev realized that. We have great documents about uh, uh, from very, from the Gorbachev Foundation and other places about the significance of Afghanistan, and it. it I mean, from the moment that Gorbachev came into office, he wanted to get out of Afghanistan. He wanted to get out of Afghanistan because it was costly. Uh, he wanted to get out of Afghanistan because it was creating tremendous demoralization. He wanted to get out of Afghanistan because many of his of the military people were incredibly d disaffected. Now. Some of you who really have probably studied this know, oh, Leffler, you're not quite right, because we also know that Gorbachev in 1985 and 86, even while feeling that way, actually increased expenditures in Afghanistan. But what we now know from the record, and what's so interesting, indeed it's absolutely fascinating, is that the discourse within the Soviet Politburo about withdrawing from Afghanistan was exactly, and I mean exactly, the same discourse about withdrawing from Vietnam in the United States. They talked again and again and again about their credibility. We want to pull out, but we don't want to be seen as running. We want to pull out, but if we pull out completely, what are our friends in, uh, in other parts of the third world going to, going to think of us? And this discussion went on and on. And finally, Gorbachev, this cabinet was split. And you know what's so interesting in the, in, in the Politburo meetings is that the person who most wanted to stay in Afghanistan at the end was Shevardnadze. Mm -hmm. And he wanted that. There's real arguments between Gorbachev and, and Shevardnadze about this. And one of the reasons Shevardnadze wanted to do it, you can see, is that he deals with these other leaders in the third world, and he knows their credi his credibility is going to be shattered, and he keeps talking about that. But finally, Gorbachev says, we must get out. Um, what it, the ultimate I don't, th I mean, I don't see it as nearly as important as a multitude of other factors. I mean, certainly it was high on Gorbachev's foreign policy agenda when he took office to get out of Afghanistan. But in his larger thinking, there is absolutely, um, in my mind, no question that Gorbachev's real preoccupation was about, ironically, the domestic society and domestic economy inside the Soviet Union. What's interesting, so interesting, is that he designed a foreign policy aimed at ameliorating the domestic situation. He designed a foreign policy to reduce distrust in the West. He very, he absolutely said, we need to take risks for peace we need to take risks for peace because we want to reduce the West's perception of threat. Gorbachev understood that the West's perception of threat was serious, it was honest, it was sincere, and he needed to reduce it. Take a mind. I mean, he really understands the security dilemma. And so what he wants to break through the security dilemma, you need to reduce the perception of threat in the West, we're re willing to take big concessions, make big concessions to do that, because we hope ultimately that if the West gets reassured, the whole arms race will ratchet down, and we will in the future not only be able to reallocate money from the military to the domestic sector, but a lot of the best technical people, a lot of engineers, a lot of the engineering know-how that was being spent, and, and that's really what he, what he wanted to do. So he designed a foreign policy that was, that was purposeful in terms of his domestic, economic, and social vision. But what he did not have, what he did not have was a domestic, economic policy that enabled him 
to accomplish that domestic vision. What's so striking about Gorbachev is that, or, is that he came gradually to understand precisely what he wanted to do with regard to the United States and Western Europe. But frankly, in my opinion, from the records we now have, he had not a clue about how to get the domestic Soviet economy to function more effectively. So you can see him going around the country and you can see him talking to other officials saying, you got to work harder, you got to have greater morale, you know, and things of that sort. It was sort of one pep talk after another. We got to get new people in here. Also, a lot. We got to get new cadres in here, young people, vigorous people, innovative people, but no policy, no coherence. And so ultimately, that was, his, that was his greatest failure. He was successful. I mean, the, the paradox about Gorbachev is that he's incredibly successful in essentially bringing about the end of the Cold War, but he fails in what is his, if you would ask him, what do, what do you most want to do? If you would ask Gorbachev in 1987, 88, what do you most want to do? It would have, he would not have said ending the Cold War. He would have said, what I most want to do is to make socialism work inside the Soviet Union. That's what I most want to do. I want to make it work better. This is just, but he failed on that. So he ends the Cold War, but fails to do what he really most wants to do. Mel, no, that was just a tremendous presentation and a real treat for me to bring the two things I care about most, Cold War history and contemporary policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost never did the two meet. You did it in such a beautiful way. And I, I just want to thank you. And please join me in thanking Mel Thank you. Thanks very much.